So it, it, uh, it falls to me to have the great pleasure of introducing you to an extraordinary lady called Robin Appleton. Now, Robin uh, is, a, is a remarkable creature uh, for several reasons. Um, she, uh, she, she discovered uh, for the first time uh, in, in the dry equatorial forests of Peru, uh, I wasn't going to say this, but I am now, the, uh, the, the spir spiritual descendant of Paddington Bear. Um, uh, apparently, Paddington was originally supposed to be a spectacled bear. Is that right? That's okay, right. so um, uh, Robin found the real thing. And um, uh, I'm not going to hold you up too much longer, but Robin is... Uh, um, uh, has, Robin has been following these creatures in the most extraordinary way. I'm not going to... Uh, uh, spoil her thunder by telling you exactly how she does it, but uh, my eyes certainly widened when I saw uh, what she has to go through to find these elusive bears. Uh, without further ado, Robin. Is that this? The green one. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. This is my first expo and to be alongside these incredible conservationists, so thank you. So spectacle bears are actually the only bear species in South America. Um, their populations are low. We estimate it to be around 5,000. And unfortunately, their population is declining. And we know so little about this species. You can see why here. Their habitat is very, very restricted. And this is preventing them from accessing critical resources. So what's happening here is the females are unable to maintain their body fat, and this is something that's essential for lactation and for cub survival. And so what we're seeing consequently is the females, um, the cubs are dying, and we're concerned that they will no longer survive in the wild. But we really believe that if we can locate these critical resources and work with the local communities to protect and to conserve these areas that we can actually stop this population decline. And so we really think with your support and with everybody here and from what I have seen downstairs, we can really make a difference here and really keep this animal uh, in South America and in the wild. So um, as Frank mentioned, spectacle bears are also known as Paddington bear, like the child's story, the deepest, darkest Peru. Although unlike the Paddington bear story, um, the real spectacle bears actually have markings on their face. And as you saw in the story, it's more of a grizzly bear that came out of Peru. So it's a little bit, <laughs> it's a story. <laughs> um, so spectacle bears are known for the white circle around their eyes. And as you can see, it looks like they're actually wearing spectacles or glasses. Um, their range is from Colombia down to the northern part of Bolivia, but unfortunately we know so little about these bears. And um, what we do know is that they are a top carnivore in a really important part of the ecosystem. So uh, we need to really understand their ecology. So typical bear habitat, and this actually explains why we know nothing about this animal. So as you can see here, all you can see is cloud and a little bit of trees. <laughs> so to actually see these animals and to really learn more about them, we had to see them. And so this is why we are extremely lucky. So you would never think that this is actually bear habitat, would you? I mean, who has ever seen a bear on a cliff like that? I mean, this is spectacular. <laughs> so we are lucky enough to study this population of bears in this type of ecosystem. So that always brings the question of how did I get there? So as you can tell, I am not native Peruvian, <laughs> or I speak, <laughs> speak English really well. Um, I am actually from Canada, and uh, I was brought up in Vancouver, and so we had black bears in our backyard, and I'm used to living around bears, and so naturally, my graduate master's research was on black bears. But after attending many of these conferences, I noticed that there is just so little being studied about or being known about the other bear species, and so we all know about these. We all know they exist, and we know more about their ecology. But what about this guy? He's important too. And like I said, he is the only one in South America. So this is something that really interests me. And so that's how I got started. I finished my dissertation and got on a plane and off I went. A little bit naive at the time, but now I'm glad I did that. But off to Peru, not knowing what I was doing, but I was hoping to find a location to do my PhD. 
So the first person I met is this man here, Javier Vallejos. He is an ex-hunter, conservationist, and probably one of the best animal trackers that I have ever met in my entire life. Of course, I'm biased, but he is incredible. And so Javier and I set off on the most, <laughs> the biggest adventure of our life, and as you can see here, the most challenging terrain probably in the world. It reaches over 100 degrees and has huge cliffs with locks of cactus that usually get stuck in your head and in your hands. So it was definitely a challenging place. So we tried to do a lot of it by, by motorbike. But uh, the, <laughs> the first thing that we learned is that two people on a motorbike looking for bears at, up the cliffs on one side, that doesn't go very well. And over the cliff we went <laughs> and into the river. <laughs> so. That was it for the motorbike. <laughs> we packed the motorbike up, we put it into the truck, and that was it. We were done. <laughs> so we did the rest of our work by foot. Um, we spent about eight months of our time looking for these bears with nothing. We found no sign, no indication that they were even in this environment that we thought they were. And so we decided to change ranges, and what we did is we had to access this new area um, through this low elevation dry forest. Actually, if you took some of those mountains away, you could think you were in Africa. Sometimes I even think I'm going to see a giraffe walk by, but it's very similar, not what people know of Peru. So one morning, I was sitting there with uh, Javier, just admiring this incredible scenery, thinking about how far we had to hike, and all of a sudden, there was this black dot, and this black dot started to move. But it couldn't be. Is it a bear? It can't be a bear. There's no bears here. And we got the binoculars out, and sure enough, it was a spectacle bear. A spectacle bear in this type of ecosystem, on the cliff, walking down. And not only did this bear just walk down this spectacular cliff, she walked right up to us. So this is the elusive bear that we thought we would never see. And here she was, a meter away. So this is actually one of the very first photographs that I have ever taken of this bear. And we called her Laura. <laughs> so this is the first video footage, it's terrible. But with the excitement of just going, oh my gosh, there's a bear coming towards us. I think you can see the breath in the video. <laughs> but you can see how different they are from regular bears. Very long, very human-like. So we informed the community that had no idea that there were bears in this area. And everybody was so excited. And as you can see by the title, the Batin Grande is the name of our town. And it says, Batin Grande, the land of wild bears. And so everyone was just so ecstatic and couldn't believe that we actually had bears here. So that got us obviously all really excited. And within the next eight months, we established this organization called the Spectacle Bear Conservation Society, because we really knew that to make a difference here, we needed to do something long term. And that's something I, I think is really important, even in science, even as graduate students, we, we need to stay put and we need to, to take the time and really establish these projects to make a, a difference in the world. So this was my first field crew, Jose, Isa, myself, and Javier. We became pretty tight in a dry forest. You don't get a lot of privacy. And we spent probably in the next four years together uh, over 200 days a year um, just living amongst these bears and learning as much as we possibly could. So Laura is really the star in the story today. <laughs> she taught us about her world. She taught us where they live, how they eat, what they do, and actually how they move through this landscape, which is one of the most fascinating features of this bear. And so <laughs> often we wondered, well, who was, who was watching who? We were supposed to be observing here, but she kept following us, and she kept getting closer and closer and closer. <laughs> and I have to say, she was a brat. <laughs> we used to put up cameras, she would take them down. We'd put up more cameras, she would take them down. <laughs> and not only that, the idea of putting up camera traps was to take photos of their face. As you can see, they all have unique facial markings. But sure enough, Laura gives us photos like this. <laughs> Can't do a lot with photos like that. <laughs> but other than that, she was also special in the sense that she was the very first animal we put a GPS collar on, and that in our world is very important to understand how they're using the habitat and where they're going, what size of a range they need. 
So she taught us how do they move through this area. I mean, for me, and especially coming from Canada, bears don't walk on cliffs, bears walk on land, <laughs> flat land with bushes. And so to understand how they move through here and why they move through here. So just being able to spend that key time with Laura, that really helped us to understand that. So here's some, to give you some perspective of this type of landscape. <laughs> Mega climber. <laughs> so she's actually trying to reach the overhang. You can see over to her right, there's little snails underneath this overhang. And this is a cliff of 100, 200 meters. And not only do they do this alone, they take their cubs. They're only three or four months old. Pretty spectacular, right? For a bear. <laughs> so one day we were sitting just checking on Laura's GPS collar, wondering how she's doing, and we noticed that there hadn't been any positions in the last few days, and thought, oh, oh. Is her, is her collar failing? Oh, another technological problem. So off to the field we went, and we got in there, and we went to the last position that she was at, actually. And so we were just setting up our camp, beautiful sunset, just getting ready to relax in the evening. And all of a sudden, we heard that. Was that Laura? <laughs> so you can imagine we really didn't sleep much that night going, what was that? <laughs> and sure enough, there was Laura. She was in an active natal den site, which is the first den we and for the species have ever found, which a birth date is really important and understanding about uh, reproduction is just key to their survival. So we were pretty excited. We set up their camera traps. We got our equipment, our recording equipment. And sure enough, <laughs> baby Martina. <laughs> so baby Martina was incredible, and it was such an honor for me and for our field team to be able to spend this kind of time right next to these, these incredible animals and just watching how they grow and actually watching Laura. She was an incredible mom and learning more about maternal care. Unfortunately, we noticed... When Martina was about eight months old, Laura seemed tired and she just wasn't moving the way she used to move. And it just, it seemed like the cub wasn't growing. She, I mean, we didn't really have a lot to go on, but we knew, we just knew something wasn't right and we couldn't really put our foot on it. But unfortunately, Laura was getting really thin and that became a real concern to us. And so one day we were walking out collecting our data from the camera traps, and we found Martina. But unfortunately, Martina was all by herself. We know that this is, a, I, I don't want to say a natural uh, behavior, but the females do have to lead the cubs. They don't hibernate, and they need to feed. So we knew that they would be leaving. It's just we found her in the afternoon, and it was getting close to nighttime, and that something just didn't seem right. So we stayed next to Martina, hoping that that Laura came back. And I have to say, as a biologist and a conservationist, that is probably the most stressful thing that can ever happen to somebody in your life, is just sitting there next to this spectacular creature and just questioning whether or not the mom is going to be coming back. So we spent the night sleeping next to her. And luckily, the next morning, um, Laura came back. So we figure she had just gone to feed on the Pasayo tree. So again, this is something spectacular about this species. Um, in the winter time, they actually feed on a tree. So you think they'd be a close relative of the beaver because they don't just eat the bark or the core. They eat the entire tree. <laughs> so, and it can take up to three weeks for these animals to eat this tree. So we suspected that she may take a while, but when she came back the next morning and she reunited with Martina, it was just as if the entire world had been lifted off of our shoulders. But weeks later... Um, she still looked like this, and actually we, we never saw Martina again, so unfortunately she didn't make it. But about six months later, breeding season came around, and sure enough, she found Fernando. 
a very handsome spectacle bearer, and he was definitely the dominant guy in the area. So uh, we had hoped that they were, were successful, and sure enough, six months later, there's Laura again. I know this is really hard to see, but you can sort of see her face sticking out of the rock there. So she, this is another den site. So she found a den site, and we set up our equipment and got all ready. And the next morning when we downloaded the, the video files, sure enough, there was two cubs, not just one cub. These are some of our favorite photos. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> but we were still really concerned about Laura. She just didn't have the body weight. And especially from what I know of black bears, it's really important for them to get fat. And they need to get through the winter. While they don't hibernate, there isn't a good food source for the winter. So they need to get fat enough in the summer but she just didn't have it. You can even see in this photo, without even knowing Laura, you can see her eyes and she looks tired and she just doesn't look well. So we were really concerned about how she was gonna manage um, two cubs in this type of ecosystem. So <clears throat> the, the weeks went by and we were doing a two-day monitoring program, but on the second month we noticed she was leaving for 24 hours and leaving these cubs. I mean, that doesn't seem right. Again, a few days went by and she left them again, but this time she didn't come back for another three days. So we started to get really concerned, but she returned. So we thought, okay, maybe this is just the cycle when they have twins. I mean, we really don't know anything about this animal. So, But <clears throat> again, a few days went by and she left again and we, we decided to stay. And uh, one day went by, two days went by, three days went by. How long do you want to wait? The fourth day came around and we we're thinking, how long can these cubs survive without their mother? So we decided we needed, we needed to take off. We needed to find Laura and figure out what was happening. This is the very last video footage we have of the, those cubs. So we set off looking for, for Laura. Sorry, this is hard for me, but, but she was gone. But Laura is only one bear. <clears throat> Sorry, that has to go through this. And in the last nine years that we've been there, 27 cubs have been born, and only four have survived to more than a year. And actually, to date, there's only two left. Sorry for the mic. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way, and these bears don't have to suffer like this. What we have learned is that, as I explained, it's really important for them to be able to come out of those high mountains up there. And you can see the cliff habitat, but they need to come down to this flat elevation, this vegetation down here, and this is why. That tree right there, that sapote tree, that is everything for them. They need that food, and that's what gets them through the winter time when they have no food. And this is what the fruit looks like. It's called the sapote fruit. It's about the size of an avocado, and it's really uh, rich in calories and really high in fat. So they need this. All of the bears need this. This is what it looks like. I've tried it, and it's... I would hate to spend my year eating that, but, but for them, it's super important. So... So what have we done? We have been working um, with some really incredible people. These communities are amazing. The people are amazing. And they are just so thrilled to have bears that they will do anything. So the first project was to try to close off really key undisturbed habitat for these bears. And something I didn't describe before, that while the habitat does exist, if these bears sense that there are people or goats or animals, they just won't come down. It's so open and it's so exposed, so they need to have just a, a really safe, quiet area for them to come down out of, those, um, out of those cliffs. So number one was keeping the hunters out, keeping the people out of there, um, and just giving them that space. So we, we fenced off huge areas with the community, put up gates, and, and tried to prevent hunters from getting in. 
but we also worked with the Cattle Ranching Association. And, um, and one of the best things about it is because these people are also so excited to have bears, they were just willing to do everything. And it was, it was just wonderful to work with them. And so we've asked them to, to try grazing their animals in areas that are just have less, less importance for bears and the disturbance is less. But another thing, as you've seen in a lot of talks here, just educating children is really important and connecting them, not only for long-term conservation, but we think also for, for now. These kids are going home and they're talking about Laura and they're talking about Fernando and they're, they're talking about all these different bears with their parents. And that's just another way we can connect them with the bears and also with the ecosystem. And you can see here, we have a boa that we actually found on, on route to the school. So it's really great to be able to talk to them about that. And then this is another program that we seem to have a lot of success with. We started about four years ago. Um, it's one of our alternative livelihood programs, and that's working with the women and trying to get them involved some way and also help them to have, um, to ha basically to have a job because women just are not employable in these areas. It's farming, farming is for men. And so it's really hard to reach out to the women and to engage them in, these, in, in, in our work and in bears. And so now we have 50 women working at our conservation center on site and they're actually making little baby Laura bears, <laughs> um, which you can see downstairs at our table. <laughs> So together with, with the community, we were actually able to, to turn this area into the first archaeological ecological park. So that was, that was really, really um, important for us and to know that those bears will, will be able to continue on. And so this is something that we saw. This isn't over years. This is actually over four months. So when this bear was able to reach the sapote, look at the difference. She doubled in size. <laughs> Thank you. So we know that this model of conservation works, but is it big enough? And that is the question. And we really feel that we need to continue our work. We need more research groups out there trying to locate these bears, learning more about their habitat, connecting with the communities, and creating more protected areas. We would love to see one huge protected area all the way up to the border of, of Ecuador. So the bears don't have to suffer, and we can ensure their survival. Again, the only bear in South America with all of the support of everyone in this room. So thank you very much.